I remember when I first learned the famous E flat major nocturne by Chopin Opus 9, number 2. I had played it from the full book of nocturnes, and I kind of peeked over to the next side to see what that piece was like. And it was really messy to play. It was a lot of accidentals immediately, super awkward, uncomfortable leaps and movement in the left hand, and tough polyrhythms in the first page. But still there was something special to the music, even with the few bars I could make out. And when I listened to a real recording of it, I heard the voice of Chopin that is so easy to fall in love with. It's playful and melancholic at the same time, and it's so elegant in all the ornamentation. So I've returned to it later in life when I had the technique for it, and it's a joy to play. So let's have a closer look at this nocturne in this video. So we have Allegretto and Scherzando, like uh, jokingly. It's pretty uncommon for a nocturne. Normally they're more slow and reflective, uh, but it's still about this kind of melodic exploration. But it's a little bit of energy here. Kind of a quirky rhythm, the dotted triplet. And going very chromatic, half notes at a time. And if you look at the left hand, we have a secondary voice underneath with these beams up. And it's often like this in Chopin, it's careful counterpoint. So it's, this voice is um, following the melody in a six and an octave. It's very hard to say what the harmony is here because it's so, and I would say it's mostly surface harmony fluctuations. In the end, we gotta get a little bit more resolution from an E minor to a B major, uh, the minor four to one. But all this chromatic, I'm not really sure what it is. We have a tonic pedal uh, in the left hand in the bass, a B throughout the whole four bars. So kind of grounding it, and then we have this chromatic movement on the surface. Well, it's a B major to begin with, of course, but then it's kind of flirting with the minor. But then the left hand goes down, we get this is more of a diminished, so I'm not gonna go into detail of all these chromatic notes because it's so complex. The second part of the phrase, it's much clearer. So it's a really nice contrast with this ambiguity. And then the bass goes down to a C sharp and we get C sharp minor, that's a two. To F sharp, that's the five. So it's just a two and two seven. To a five, dominant seven. But of course, the genius is in the melody. It's just so perfect, but with all these notes. But it, it's landing on the third of F sharp. It's always very resonating. Okay, now we go for a second round of the same material, but it's a variation in, well, in the rhythm this time. So we get these quintuplets. But it's only going around these chromatic notes, same. But using more notes. 
Okay, let the ornamentation orgy begin. And now for the second part of the phrase, we get to take a new turn. it's again resolving properly to B major. So this part is very important for the form of the piece. It's a very substantial big piece and a very complex form and uh, this is kind of an answer phrase that's gonna return a lot. So it's basically just three repetitions of this. So we go to C sharp major. Uh, the first time it's uh, remember C sharp minor so it's a two uh, in B major, it's a two chord. Now we get C sharp major and C sharp major seven in first inversion. That's pointing to F sharp major, so it's a dominant of the dominant. Uh, it's a common thing to do in tonal music. You can use both of these ver versions of the second note in the scale. F sharp major and again, with variations, upbeats, and, and a third time, it's a culmination, we go here, super nice chord, this bit of tinge of melancholy, suddenly, uh, it's kind of a C sharp, half diminished, so even yet another version, with F sharp in the bass. And then resolving using these notes as leading notes to an F-sharp major, which is a dominant to B major. Providing the resolution also. So moving on, now we get the full repeat of all this material, but with new variations in ornamentation. This one is hard. <laughs> now we're off the hook of the quintuplets. So this is a much easier version, just straight with 16th notes. So if you play this, you can actually practice this before and then you add the quintuplet element. Okay, we got eight against three instead. Uh, Skilzando Chopin is really in a playful mood here. And now the same answer, going to C sharp major and F sharp major. Okay, now we go to the next part of the piece. Now we get some new material, and it's again a little bit of a contrast to the chromatic um, ideas of the first. Now we get sostenuto, legato melody, it's diatonic and it's just super lush and lovely, this place. So what is going on here? Let's look at the tricks that Chopin employs. So okay, let's start with the bass. It's slowly going down, one note at a time. So and it's quite uh, in the low register. And then we have a melody. This is a suspension, four to three. G sharp minor and seven, G sharp minor seven. 
aching suspensions. And then we have the octave lift. Take the note one octave higher. And now here we have this uh, major seventh chord. So F sharp major seven. major seven. Those chords are also this uh, nostalgic and uh, lush. Another octave lift and a little bit of more of melodic. The melody needs to uh, play some more notes uh, to the final. Going to G sharp minor and continuing to A sharp major. So it, when you play it, it feels like a B flat major because that's an easier way to spell it. But in the key, it's an A sharp major. And now a new force enters here and it's pushing the melody upward. So and reaches a culmination. Comes down quickly again, but we're still only on A sharp major, and it's a fermata, and then we're jumping to this part. So this is the closing part for the first section. It also acts as the closing part of the new material. So it's really cool how it acts like a refrain and closing different parts of music, always coming back to this in the end. Okay, now we have another repeat of the second section with the, the launchy feeling. little bit more variation. It's hard the first time, but it's hard the second time. And yet again the closing. But now, surprise. And so that's the whole middle section. I couldn't stop playing because it's <laughs> so fun. So it's a big middle section with contrasting material. We're thrown into B minor and agitato and forte. Right hand has melody and these syncopated chords. It's 
a bit similar to the E major nocturne opus 62 number two a section in there has a this kind of syncopation texture as well and the left hand has this stormy rumbling eighth notes with the chromatic turns <laughs> quite hard, uh, needs a lot of practice. And overall we have this force pushing upward, the melody is, is uh, striving upwards. And there's a lot of small harmonic changes going on on the surface again like twists and turns. For example, the left hand has this C natural and then turns to C sharp. So the So it's the same chord E minor but with the C natural. And then it's E minor with the C sharp. Now we kind of would the first time it's G natural here, but now it's D sharp to G natural. Very chromatic. Let's not get into detail on every single note. <laughs> the overarching force here is we we grow now. chord, a C major, kind of surprising. Uh, it's a diminished and dying down here and ending, uh, resolving in a soft way to B minor here. And then we get the middle section of the middle section. It's a very substantial piece. Now it's even more tense, uh, diminished, chromatic music. It's a fun um, technique you get to use here. Very rare to play the left hand like this. So use the thumb for two notes in a row. I think it's the best way to play these bars. It's a suggestion in my edition. Now we get the same material as the sequence, one note higher. The first time is, second time it's. And here again, we have a oscillation between D sharp and D natural in the left hand. really messy. So the D natural is more um, kind of dark. The D sharp is more bright and uh, kind of positive. Like yeah, it's flipping a switch uh, very quickly between two modes. Okay, the dark mode wins in the end. Back to the main section of the middle section, the B minor. But now it gets interrupted again. We would expect the soft resolve the first time but just gets thrown in. This is going back now a transition back to the main section and we go go on to this chord. Like it's the same the, the texture from the first section just comes in and interrupts. 
and it's exactly the same place as the middle section interrupt. So we're now like continuing as if nothing happened in the middle section. But of course it happened, can't deny it. So this is now a repeat of the first material, just as the piece begins, uh, a recap. And it's, it only comes one time in the end here. Uh, it can't go on longer than that because it's been so many times already. Uh, it's uh, some new variations again, of course. Perhaps my favorite bar of the piece. So nice, like just flying. Quintuplets again. So this closing part, now it's the fifth time we've had it and every time it's slightly different on what rhythm if it's or if it's like the placement of those rhythms and how many upbeats and there is because it's every time it's three times uh, of this c sharp to f sharp and going up and it's a nightmare to memorize the different versions uh, I finally found there is a system to it, but it's too complicated to explain. Like the first two are similar, then three and four and five are more similar, but still they're different in different ways. Now the final time, the third time of the fifth time, it's clean here and uh, eighth notes. To kind of set up a new turn. And the melody gets to blossom for like the final chorus. And this leads into a cadenza, like the one we had, we have in the end of the E flat major nocturne, but this one is longer and harder. It's so nice, senza tempo, without time, and just this kind of uh, fourth uh, open sound harmonically. So this is it reminds us of the E flat major nocturne cadenza. And then now we go to F sharp seven, the dominant, and now this part it reminds me of Liszt's Liebestraum, the second cadenza in that one. And resolving to B major, and for the final two bars we get a drawn out chord with the double arpeggios up and down uh, with the gravitas that the piece deserves. It's a B major with an add nine, the C sharp. If you just lay it like that, you have a super nice sound. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets. A special shout out to my Patreon sponsors, XGuo, M. Massimilla, and P.E. Martin.